in the service of much greater things, but there's a reason we learn these very basic lessons. So, you can think of these geometric curves as the faces of functions, and the way I organized the book was to look at, say, the top seven or eight functions in calculus and their curves, their faces, which is why I, nicknamed, I called this talk Dangerous Curves. But <laughs> that wasn't enough. I mean, I, I was determined when I was writing this book not to do what I did in high school. I was determined not to just memorize the rules, because it turns out I, I'm actually, many of us are very good at this, right? We figure out what we have to do to get the A. And we're very good at blindly following the rules, and we don't really understand why it is what we're doing, where these things are coming from. We don't really grasp the importance of it, and I did not want that to happen. So one of the first questions I asked is, okay, I get it. I get that these are functions. I've read all the little definitions, but to be perfectly honest, I want to know where did you get that. I want to know where this function came from. And it seems very basic, but it was a very good uh, exercise for me to do. Uh, my husband would basically give me the function, the, the algebraic version, and he would have me plug in numbers all along the graph, and he would have me solve that, plot the point. It was, it was the method of exhaustion all over again, believe me. And eventually you could see a curve forming. You could see that the, the different points, the data points, would form this curve. And that is essentially what a curve is. You take every possible point on that curve, you know, and you fill in the value, and then you get this lovely thing. The key here is that it's bigger than the sum of its parts. Once you know that, once you know that mathematical function, you know that curve, then it becomes a predictive model. Once you know one function, <laughs> then you can use that to figure out other things that you want to know about the system that you're trying to model. And in this case, I dragged my husband to Disneyland and I made him go on all the rides. And we went looking for physics and calculus on the rides. And one of the things, one of my favorites was the Tower of Terror. Um, I don't know if you, how many of you are familiar with the Tower of Terror or something similar? Some of you. Essentially, it's, uh, they put you in this little box and they whip you up very quickly to, you know, upwards and you get this moment of hang time at the top and then they drop you. And they do it a couple more times. You go up and down and you get that little wonderful moment of zero gravity hang time there and then you end up at the end of the bottom. So we went on this ride and I'm all woohoo! And my husband at the end is very excited and I'm thinking he enjoyed the ride. He goes, we just made a parabola. This is awesome. <laughs> This is what it's like to be married to a physicist. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing. Um, let's say that, you know, we know, because we know it's a parabola, free fall, we know our position at every point in time. We know that because we know the function. We know that that forms a parabolic curve. It's great. What if we want to know how fast we're going? That we don't know. We didn't bother to measure it. We didn't think to measure it. We didn't think to bring in a speedometer or something to figure out how fast we're going. We can actually use calculus to figure this out. And we can, do, we can take the position function and we can, we can uh, take a derivative and that will give us the velocity function which tells us how fast we were going at every point in time. You can take one function, turn it into another, and then you can use that to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. So it becomes this kind of interlocking, interrelated sort of thing. You are solving problems. It can get very complicated. Uh, we also went on Space Mountain, which he loved also. Um, in this case, uh, and this actually has do is done all the time. If, if you've ever uh, uh, physics classes often go to amusement parks, they build their own accelerometers. These are devices that measure acceleration, the g-forces, um, and you can use that to measure all the g-forces and map it out along your ride. All of that taken together is going to be your acceleration function. Um, but here's the thing, on Space Mountain, you, you, uh, if you're in the dark, that's part, it's not the most exciting coaster ride, but you don't know where you're going. What if you want to know? What if you want to track the path that you took? Well, you don't know that, but you had your little accelerometer and you know your acceleration. You know all of those g-forces. You can actually take a double integral. Um, you have to go through two steps now. You have to take one integral and that's going to give you the velocity and then you take a, in another one of the velocity and that gives you the position. It's the adding up of little things over time. Um, but that's another way of solving a very real practical problem. And, you know, Space Mountain. So there's a lot of examples. If you really want to get complicated, you can do the mad teacup ride, because now we're talking about circular motion and angular momentum and vectors, which is the direction in which you are moving, and they can change a lot. It's, it's quite elaborate, actually. You have these little individual teacups that, that you get to spin, you know, one way. But they're on uh, a platform that is spinning this way, and that platform in turn is on another platform that is spinning this way. 
And what you find as you're going along on the ride is that there are times when no matter how hard you pull, you can't get yourself to spin very quickly. And every now and then you hit that sweet spot and you can spin really, really fast. That's the vectors. Sometimes they all line up perfectly and you get to spin really, really fast. And sometimes they're all canceling each other out and working against each other and you can't get past that. Again, a very complicated thing to actually do in the classroom, but a wonderful example of both math and physics in the real world. Now, around the same time I was writing this book, we were also house hunting. It had never even occurred to me that I was doing calculus in my house hunting, um, but it is a form of comparison shopping. Now, here, what you're trying to find is an, uh, you're trying to have an, a mult, um, an optimization problem. You're trying to find the best, the best way to do something. Um, or the, the one thing that most meets your criteria. In this case, I think we kept it to a couple variables for simplicity in the book, but you can have as many as you want, and it just gets more complicated. Think about what you're doing when you're buying a house or buying a new car or a cool dress for the prom. I mean, you have certain constraints and variables, right? There's price. Um, there's location, there is, you know, you definitely want that little sunroof or whatever. Um, and you figure out which things are most important to you, and you rate them, and you, and you look at various things and, and figure out how they measure up according to those variables, and add all that together, and at some point you pick those things that fall along the top of that curve. That's your optimization curve. So I was doing this the old, ha the old fashioned way with columns and things like that, and my husband said, you know, you could just make a function and it will tell you. And we ended up doing this as kind of an exercise, and he was right. The, the things that I was already leaning towards based on my little columnated thing actually did turn out to be the same houses that showed up, you know, in our model. So, you know, experiment theory, it, it all comes together. Um, I went surfing. Wave dynamics, um, any kind of wave, that, that Fourier transform I talked about, that's a sine wave. Radio waves, anything to do with that, any kind of sound, any kind of light, you are going to be dealing with calculus. Uh, more practically, in order to surf, because I took my first surfing lesson when I went to Hawaii, you have to match the, the speed of the wave as it comes in, and you've got to calculate how fast it's going, when it's going to get to you, and then you yourself have to be moving. It's actually a miracle anyone can surf at all, but eventually we figure it out. Architecture. Very, very, uh, I, I had written a piece for New Scientist, which is, I think, one of the reasons I started getting interested in math, too, um, on arches in architecture. It turns out, how did they know how to build those arches in like the 1500s or 1600s? And it turns out that Robert Hooke, among others, had figured out, he had this line called, as, as hangs the flexible chain, so rigid is the, is the inverted arch. So if you want to know how the forces are going to line up perfectly to have a stable arch once it's inverted, you, hang it, you take a chain and you hang it and you see where it naturally falls. Where are the not lines of forces nestling? And that forms the catenary curve. That is, that, that is actually a calculus problem. Then you invert that, and you've got your ideal shape for an arch. If you've ever seen the Sydney Opera House, it has a very, very elaborate structure with all those curves and things, and they definitely needed math, <laughs> and specifically calculus, to be able to figure out how all the forces were going to work in order to make that building stable. Calculus in the real world again. Cooling cup of coffee, and uh, we got drenched at Space Mountain, and so we ended up doing a little mini calculus problem while we were waiting for our clothes to dry off. Um, it turns out that that slow drip, drip, drip does follow an exponential decay curve. <laughs> Exercise. You don't think about this because the machines now do it for us, but when you're in the gym and you're trying to burn off calories on the Stairmaster, whatever, you know, and you want to know how many calories you've burned, um, your exercise machine is, is essentially taking, uh, a, it, it's, it's essentially integrating the rate of the calories burned to get the total calories expended. And it will probably, in order to get that rate, it's going to need to know things like your height, your weight, you know, your, your age. The more of those variables you can figure in, the more accurate the reading will be. Often those machines are, are really far off, just in case you think you really did burn off a thousand calories. Um, but <laughs> uh, it is exactly, nonetheless, conceptually what's being done here is calculus. And I know you're all curious about the zombies. I didn't just make that up. It turns out that you know, not only is there a calculus of zombies, but there's an actual mathematical paper based on the calculus of zombies. Um, it was done by a man who's uh, actually, I think he's Toronto, I believe. His name's Robert Smith. Um, he, d he did this with some of his students. He wanted to construct an epide epidemiological model, which is essentially how you study the spread of diseases and also how you assess how effective your intervention strategies are likely to be. So this is actually a very complicated problem. 
Um, among other things, you know, you, you, have to, you have to do several different equations. You basically have these coupled differential equations in order to do this. In, in this case, you've got like three or four that he had to like work through. Because you have to figure out, you know, how many humans are born during a given part of time, how many, how many become zombies during that time period, how many die, you know, how many of the dead become zombies, how many zombies you actually end up killing, you know, it just, it becomes a very complicated thing. But nonetheless, it turned out to be a viable model, and they ended up with an answer. Um, it turns out that hiding in the shopping mall, you know, we've seen the movies, we know that doesn't work. You know, it's like, they're going to come and find you regardless. It also turns out that if you do absolutely nothing when, when the zombies, when the first zombie appears, and you just kind of, you don't kill it right away, um, it will wipe out an entire village, the entire population, in basically three days. Um, because the dead don't stay dead. <laughs> this just ruins everything. You get this exponential growth curve, and they just overrun, and before you know it, the whole world is zombies. I don't think he actually figured out what happens when there's no food left for the zombies, whether they all start dying off, but history would tell us that that would be the case. So the only viable strategy is what he called the impulsive eradication scheme. Um, Zombieland put it best, time to nut up or shut up. You want to basically kill as many zombies as fast as possible in a shorter period of pos as, as possible because that's the only way you're going to stop the spread. The, the rate of the spread of the disease is so great that's the only way you have any shot. And even then, zombie land, I wouldn't necessarily call it a happy ending. It's like there were a few survivors. There's a caveat with these kinds of models, and I do feel compelled to say this, which is particularly when you're modeling human behavior. When, it, when disease outbreaks, that is, that is kind of one of the unknown variables. You know, how are human beings really going to behave? We know how we think they ought to behave. We can tell them, based on the math, how they should behave. Will they behave that way? And how can you possibly study that ethically? Because you certainly can't, you know, wire up a, a town of villagers, give them all the plague, and then see how they react, because that would just be horrible. But you can do it in World of Warcraft. And the, the wonderful thing, uh, several years ago, they actually did have an epidemic similar to, it was called corrupted blood. And essentially it was a virus that was designed to be a challenge for one of the upper levels, but somebody kind of screwed up when they were doing the coding. Only experienced players were supposed to get hit with this virus, and then it basically meant that it would slowly sap away their life points and they had a, a certain amount of time in order to finish, you know, whatever, the, you know, kill the, the captain on that level. That, that was the task that they had to, to, in order to win that level. So, but the problem is, they didn't stop to think. There were also these non-playable animal companions and things that could just move freely about the space, and they got infected. And nobody thought about those animal companions, much the way that during the Black Death, nobody thought that rats and fleas had anything to do with you know, how this thing was spreading. Um, so it ended up spreading to like all the levels. And here's the thing, if you're a beginning player, you don't have that many life points. You die like that. And you die horribly, like your head explodes. You can actually see these little bloody things there. You can go online, there's all these YouTube videos that people recorded of the gameplay, of just people freaking out. And this one woman at Rutgers decided, this is fantastic, this is the experiment I've been looking for. She actually collaborated with the game designer, and they, they gave her access to their data files of what happened.